Hi, hello. Welcome to another episode of Isaiah's Newsstand. It's your host, Isaiah Edwards. The date is January the 9th, 2024. Hopefully this episode finds you well in good spirits and high hopes. As for me, I'm doing pretty good. Uh, Today was a good day, but I will say overall it was a bit of a wet and damp one for me. Uh, It's been raining all day. It's been very cold, but I'm happy to be home and, you know, trying to warm up. So that's good. That's nice. Uh, Let's see here. Food Corner was the, the old Mexican beef and rice bowl. It was yummy as usual. Um, let's see here. I'm going to go ahead and skip my, uh, usual startup. Let's go ahead and get right into the news. I'm chomping at the bit today. From the Associated Press, armed men storm an Ecuador TV studio during a live broadcast as attacks in the country escalate. Masked men broke onto the set of a public television channel in Ecuador, waving guns and explosives during a live broadcast on Tuesday, and the president issued a decree declaring that the South American country had entered an internal armed conflict. The men, armed with pistols and what looked like sticks of dynamite, entered the set of the TC television network in the port city of Guayaquil, during a news program that was airing live in thousands of homes across the nation and shouted that they had bombs. Noises similar to gunshots could be heard in the background. It was not immediately clear if any station uh, personnel were injured. Let's see here. Skip ahead a bit. Ecuador has been rocked by a series of attacks, including the abductions of several police officers in the wake of a powerful gang leader's apparent weekend escape from prison. President Daniel Naboa on Monday declared a national state of emergency, a measure that lets authorities suspend people's rights and mobilize the military in places like prisons. Shortly after the gunmen stormed the TV station, Naboa issued another decree designating 20 drug trafficking gangs operating in the country as terrorist groups and authorizing Ecuador's military to neutralize these groups within the bounds of international humanitarian law. Ecuador's national police chief later announced that authorities had arrested all the mass intruders. Police Commander Cesar Zapata told the TV channel Tele... Telemazanas, that officers seized the guns and explosives the gunmen had with them. He said 13 people were arrested. Uh, also, it tells us that the uh, Los Chernos gang leader Adolfo Macias, uh, uh, whose alias is Fito, was discovered missing from his cell in a low security prison Sunday. He was scheduled to be transferred to a maximum security facility that day. Um, though they're not sure if this was all orchestrated around, um, Adolfo or not. Um, also it's not just, um, Los Chiernos that is obviously designated, you know, that, that, that's why there's like 20 groups. Um, so, I mean, we'll definitely see, you know, what comes of, you know, the situation at hand from the state of emergency. If, uh, for Ecuador, you know things actually get wrapped up. I know we've covered them. I think the, yeah, the last time we covered Ecuador was from the elections. Obviously, before that was the assassination of a prime candidate. And, um, you know, that that was where we kind of put our foothold into Ecuador and really started talking about the situation, how things are so fraught um, right now, at least currently. Uh, so, yeah, uh, pretty dicey situation at hand. Uh, we'll see. Uh, one last bit I wanted to leave off on. Uh, Macias, who was convicted of drug trafficking, murder, and organized crime, was serving a 34-year sentence in La Regional Prison in the port of Guayaquil. Experts and authority have acknowledged that gang members practically rule from inside the prisons, and Macias was believed to have continued controlling his groups from within the detention facility. Okay, Uh, let's move on to Germany. I'm going to talk about some farmers getting active. Uh, from the Associated Press, German farmers block roads with tractors and stage protests against plan to scrap diesel tax breaks. Farmers blocked highway access roads in parts of Germany Monday and snarled traffic elsewhere with their tractors, launching a week of protests against a government plan to scrap tax breaks on diesel used in agriculture. 
Chancellor Olaf Scholz's unpopular three-party coalition infuriated farmers last month by drawing up plans to abolish a car tax exemption for farmers, for farming vehicles, and the diesel tax breaks. The proposals were part of a package to fill a 17 billion euro or $18.6 billion hole in the 2024 budget. Um, now, they have, the government has backed off, um, at least as of, uh, yeah, last Thursday. Uh, they climbed down partially saying that the car tax exemption would be retained and cuts in the diesel tax breaks would be staggered over three years. But the German Farmers Association said it was still insisting on the plans being reversed fully and would go ahead with a week of action starting Monday. So essentially, you know, Olaf realized, oh shit, this isn't going over well. And this was something that they were trying to kind of, I feel like they wanted to put like a, like a green spin on this or whatever. But essentially, they were trying to budget their, their, their 2024 and um, essentially... They were vetoed or they were blocked from taking out um, COVID money and redistributing redistributing it back into, you know, other projects. So they're like, oh, shit, we got to kind of make some hard moves here. We got to make some hard decisions. And so they tried to do this uh, tax break for the farmers. And I feel like, you know, it just it blew. It's blown up in their faces. And um, essentially now they're they're dealing with the brunt of it, which is essentially, you um, Let's see, in some areas, farmers used tractors to block entry roads to highways early Monday. There was disruption due to convoys of tractors in and around some cities as well. Production at Volkswagen Auto Plant in Emden in northwestern Germany was stopped because access roads were blocked, preventing employees from getting to work. So, I mean, clearly this is something that is instantly effective, instantly gummy. Um, you know, you, you can't get to work, you know, you're stuck at lights, there's so much traffic because there's literally all these tractors just coming up here, just chilling now. Um, there was another situation that took place. Uh, the protests are under scrutiny after a group of farmers on Thursday prevented Vice Chancellor Robert, Robert Habeck from disembarking a, fa- a ferry in a small North Sea port as he returned from a personal trip to an offshore island. The incident drew condemnation from government and opposition figures and the Farmers Association. Authorities have warned that far-right groups and others could try to capitalize on the protests. Farmers Association Chairman Joachim Rutweid, Rutweid, um, yeah, I'm butchering that, sorry, told RBB Info Radio Monday that we will ensure that we are not infiltrated by such groups. Um, which I, I think that that's something that I, I kind of was like, oh, let me talk about that a little bit. Cause that happens a lot when you have, uh, you know, types of protests we've referenced that before, even with just the ceasefire thing, which also I got to say, you know, I'm lacking in that in terms of like my coverage there. I know Biden had some kind of like campaign speech and literally a group, a big group of protesters just came and started shouting at his ass. And I love to see that shit because essentially it's like, yeah, man, no, you we are going to hold you accountable for the shit that you've done, dude. And it was also weird in that situation that like you had people in the audience going like, yeah, no, four more years. And this is where like, I, this is where I hate being a liberal because it's just like, dude, like, don't you understand why these people have come and they're here and th- you have so many people, not just in America, but worldwide, internationally coming out into the streets, demanding a ceasefire now from their, from the people that have a chance to actually talk to Israel and say, you guys got to stop it or we're not going to fucking support you. Like, don't you see that? Like, that is something that takes priority, but it's like, oh no, we got to beat Trump. Like, bro, what are you talking about? It, at, at the end of the day, yes, dude, Trump's a problem. Yeah, we get it, man. Conservatives suck dick. We, uh, I, yeah, dude, true. But you know what? You know what else sucks dick? Being an inhumane piece of shit and then just being like, oh, that's okay though. You know what I mean? At least we're all right. At least, uh, you know, we're a democracy. Like, get the fuck out of here. Like, no, your your officials, your leaders, our leaders should do better. They should be fucking better. And Biden should be shook. Period. Point the fuck blank. Same thing with goddamn Olaf. Same thing with this motherfucker who was on his little fucking trip and now he's scared. Now, don't get me wrong. Back to my point. It is easy for a peaceful style of protest to be infiltrated by an extremist group. 
You know what I mean? I know that if it's typically a leftist or something like that, I'm like, yeah, cool, awesome. But anything that is free radical and, and extreme or whatever, and like, especially if it's violent, yeah, that's a bad outcome. That's gonna be a negative thing for the protest as a whole. It puts a black eye on it quite literally, and that's not good. I, I do believe that nonviolent protest is usually the best and most effective. Um, though I do understand why violent things happen. I get it. I do understand what a tit for tat is and how that evolves. Um, but that being said, I do think that this is a good thing to be peaceful and it should stay that way. And you hate to see a alt-right group kind of come in and, and ink things up. And it's like, no, dude, that's not what we're about, dog. You're fucking harsh on the vibes. Ugh. So, um, yeah, I just kind of wanted to get in there and talk about that. Um, you know, there's more details here. Um... Let's see the, um, yeah, let's read this part. The budget revamp that included the disputed cuts was required after Germany's highest court annulled an earlier decision to repurpose 60 billion euros. Uh, let's get the conversion. Originally meant to cushion the fallout from COVID-19 pandemic for measures to help combat climate change and modernize the country. The maneuver fell afoul of Germany's strict self-imposed limits on running up debt. So essentially they tried to, like I said, paint this kind of green spin like, oh, okay, like, uh, you know, we'll just cut down on the diesel, eh? And um, I can't remember if I've heard this either from them previously or if I had heard this about France trying to do the same kind of thing. I don't know. But um, yeah, there we go. Uh, that, we'll call that coverage there. Um, speaking of French, or at least French sounding things, we have to talk about a man named LaPierre. Um, from Reuters, LaPierre turned NRA into Wayne's World, New York lawyer says at Graft Trial. Wayne LaPierre ran the National Rifle Association, or NRA, as Wayne's World for decades. A lawyer for the New York State said at the start of a gun rights group's uh, corruption trial three days after LaPierre suddenly resigned as chief executive. Now, I want to just preface this with um, just a shout out to fraudsters. This That was the first time I had heard about Wayne LaPierre and um, him as, um, you know, president, I think president, CEO, whatever the fuck, of the NRA, uh, you know, nonprofit organization, you know, protect our guns, protect our rights, you know, to bear arms, blah, 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 blah. Uh, that's them, and um, yeah, essentially, there is a lot at play here that I kind of wanted to talk about a little bit, and I, I don't know how deep we'll go on the trial as it goes along. Probably just one of those things where I want to touch base here, and then we'll probably come back around come the verdict. Uh, but uh, New York Attorney General Letitia James had sued the NRA and its longtime leader in August of 2020 saying the group diverted millions of dollars to fund luxuries for top officials, including travel expenses for LaPierre to several resorts. And this is a situation where it's like, look, your money, your tax paying dollars are going to this organization that is tax exempt because it's like, you know, for charity and all this kind of shit. And it's supposed to go to protecting your gun rights. You know what I mean? And you know, say what you will about in terms, you know, of the right to bear arms and all that shit. That's not really what I want to angle this conversation about. What it really is about is, look, the NRA is supposed to do the service that it's saying to do. So wouldn't you think, if, if you're a member who is contributing to this society, this organization, that your money should be going to promote gun safety, gun whatever the fuck, gun promotion, gun, they should be doing all that lobbying shit. It shouldn't be going to a 1% group, you know, aka Wayne LaPierre and his like upper cabal of people so they can just jet set around and pal around and dig off with that money. You know what I mean? That should be something that is considered illegal. Um, but uh, for Wayne LaPierre and his defense team and, you know, the other people who are involved, they're saying, nah, it's cool. Like, you know, this free speech, <laughs> which is like a crazy argument to me. Like, what do you mean? Like, we're allowed. And I guess maybe that's their defense is that, no, this is a political like witch hunt. You know, they're coming for our values. And that's really what this is about. They're trying to silence us, uh, which is like, nah, man, I, I think it's the grifting. I think that's the problem here. Um 
But let's see here. James has said that the NRA and LaPierre's misconduct violated state laws governing nonprofits, which she enforces. Um, The NRA, founded in 1871, has denied wrongdoing and said it has made reforms, which is kind of incriminating, you think, in that that kind of statement. But they're saying, hey, like what you're coming for us, uh, coming for about us on, we've already made changes on. We're already growing. We're already working on that. Like, what do you mean? Um, Let's see here. Um, in an email statement, the NRA's lawyer, William Brewer, said James's office cannot prove that the association or its board did anything wrong um, and that the outline of the case is about the past, not the present. Uh, I mean, we'll see how that goes. Um, let's see here. Since taking over in 1991, LaPierre built the NRA into a political powerhouse that pressed Washington and state houses to expand gun rights, even as mass shootings mounted nationwide. And I think that LaPierre's hustle here was the fact that he was getting results. Like, even though, like, you know, he's controversial, I would not agree with any of the fucking shit he says and does. It was one of those things where you see, when you look at the numbers, that, like, even though, like, I feel like the, the in terms of statistics, I'm just kind of just reaching and grabbing here, the numbers didn't really go up in terms of more gun owners. People were still going out and buying guns. And it's because, like, it's just such a good sale. It doesn't matter who's in charge. Like, people like Wayne LaPierre were pushing this narrative that you always needed to buy a gun. There was always some more that you could get. And I think that this kind of style led to success. And it's one of those things where... LaPierre kind of took this wave and rode with it, which you can say there's nothing wrong with that. But yet again, if the money and proceeds that you're getting are not going back into your organization to improve and enrich said organization, and it's just going into the the, the wallets of the people up at the very top, especially too, that's the thing that sucks too, it's at the very top. It's not like people at the lower rungs of this organization are seeing any of this money. They're just working hard. They're just doing the fucking real work, the street work, and, you know, not getting anything for it. But you can also make the counter of, well, hey, who gives a shit? If they're donating their money and they're happy with the results, then, you know, who's to say this is criminal then? You know, they're suckers for that. And that's a whole personal issue, right? I don't know, you know? So maybe the defense has something there. That's why, like I said, to me, I don't really want to take the whole, like, or oh, guns good or bad. That's not really the fucking point here. At the end of the day, we're talking about, is the NRA on the level is Wayne LaPierre on the level? And I do feel like specifically Wayne LaPierre is not. And I feel like there's enough compliance by the NRA that you can say, we should be having this trial. We should be having this conversation. Um, But I know Letitia James wanted to essentially shut the whole thing down. Um, Yeah, James had previously sought to close the case. But uh, Cohen, the um, Justice Joe Cohen of the state Supreme Court, essentially shot that down and that was as a that was of March of 2022. So uh, she's not going to get that full thing and I don't think that she even should by the law, at least you know, by the number have as we have it. I don't think that that actually would make sense or be coherent. I think maybe that's a little bit too uh maybe radical for me, uh, even me, I don't know. But um interesting situation at play. Like I said, I know I'm not doing it justice. Do I fucking ever? No, I fucking don't. But um, that is why I reference the Frosters because they do a great job breaking the whole thing down, giving you a lot more history, a lot more context, yada, yada, yada. So feel free, look that up. Plus, they're a great podcast. I love listening to them. Uh, Let's see here. What else do we have? I think we're at our last story. Okay, cool. Over the river and through the woods. Actually, no, we're going to New York and we're going uh, under the city. Uh, well, this, this is a weird one. Um, let me take my, my break. I feel like I earned it and then we will get into it. Ooh, yeah, that's the good stuff. Okay. Hmm. <laughs> <coughs> <coughs> mm. Ooh, uh. 
from Metro. <coughs> Metro! Secret synagogue tunnels are causing chaos in New York. What's really going on? Good question. Um, also, there's another article. Let me let it load. From Eyewitness News ABC7. Nine arrested after secret tunnel found at Chabad headquarters in Brooklyn. Uh, I think I'm mainly referencing the Metro one, but I might go back and forth. Uh, chaotic scenes erupted at a synagogue in New York on Monday when a group of young Orthodox Jewish men attempted to stop construction workers filling a filling in a network of secret underground tunnels. When the tunnels were discovered in December at the Chabad Lubavitch World Headquarters in Brooklyn, the synagogue's leaders called in construction crews to flood them with concrete. But a group of Chabad Lubavitch students in their teens and early 20s gathered at the building on Monday afternoon in an attempt to protect the hidden passageways. Videos from the scenes, video, videos from the scene of captured Orthodox men vandalizing a cement truck that had begun to pump cement into the tunnel. Others were entering the building and tearing up wood paneling, revealing a network of pathways beneath. Several of the men ran into the tunnels to stop them being filled, while one used a hammer to smash a synagogue wall to make the tunnel wider. In another video, a young Orthodox Jewish man climbs out of a hole in a pavement outside. The building then runs away. Um, let's see here. Let's scroll a little bit further. There's a picture of the man coming out of, um, this like sewage grater and he's like in full, like, you know, Orthodox Jewish garb. He's got the hat on, he's got the jacket on, which is crazy to me to have a fit on like this and you're running it through a tunnel and then out of a, a, a grater or something. That's crazy to me. Um, but Hey, I mean, I guess you, you do what you gotta do. He's, a, I don't know. He's committed. Uh, let's see here. Why are there secret tunnels under the Jew or under the Brooklyn synagogue? That's a great question. That's what I was asking. Uh, the underground tunnels connected the women's section of the 77 building to an unused mikvah on the nearby Union Street. A mikvah is a bath used in traditional purity rituals. For instance, Jewish law requires women, excuse me, to immerse in a mikvah before marriage and bathing in a mikvah is part of the Jewish conversion process. Uh, they do show the video, <clears throat> like it's a link from someone's um, Instagram. It's called Chinfo Official. And it's so eerie because this looks like a Resident Evil situation where like you're in this like derelict looking room. It's full of boxes. And then like you're, it looks like you're on your knees and like everything's dirty and muddy. And then you're going into this tunnel and then uh, like you get out and the next thing you know, like you're in this other room. And it's like, no, man, like I'm not playing Legend of Zelda right now. And I, I guess this is what these guys were trying to protect and build into now this is another reason why i referenced the other article apparently this was something that they have been trying to go through proper legal channels i think to like get the ordinance to like get the okay on but that's been you know it's been dragging on for years it's been an ongoing thing if i'm not mistaken so i think there might have been a, a group or a subset that might have been saying hey let's just fucking build it let's just fucking make this thing happen and they've been like trying to work at it and I think once this became like a discovered thing, it was an anonymous tip at first, and then it's like, oh, no, no, no. And I think the the actual headquarters, the organization, they made a statement. They phoned it in saying, yo, we want you guys to come in and fill this up. That's not what we want here. But then this younger group, this younger set, maybe the group that was working it, I don't know. This is where my speculation hat is on. They came to defend their work, defend this project, and they weren't going to leave. And, you know, they're, they, they're getting arrested and, like, they're, they're, they're chanting, they're doing shit, they're, they're acting up. It's intense. Like, I would definitely suggest you to watch it if you're curious, if you're interested. Uh, there's a lot going on. And I, I have more questions than I do answers for you today. Like I said, this is some breaking news for me. So that, that's where we're going to leave it. Uh, that's, that's the chutzpah for the day. Um, if you'd like to help out, if you'd like to support the effort, I do have a Patreon, patreon.com, says Isaiah News. Um, it helps out a lot, you know, your financial support, if you will, um, goes a long way. 
Um, and I also shout you out at the top of the month. Uh, also, I do it like on site too. You know, if you hit me up, I'll be like, oh, okay, next episode, you're on for sure. Um, but yeah, at the top of the month, I shout you out, plug a project if you like, and then free ways to hit me up, IsaiahNews1 at gmail.com. Feel free to follow me or the podcast on any of the socials. Love when I see a new follow on the like Facebook page. Yeah, that's right. I use Facebook. I'm on that. Um, wherever. We love to see it. Also, another thing I love to see, new YouTube subscribers. I checked that shit today and I saw, oh shit, we went up like by four, four new subscribers. So hi, hello, sorry I'm late. If I just missed you, I'm bad at checking numbers and sometimes they make me sad. Um, but yeah, thank you so much. It really does mean a lot. It, you know, all the subscriptions, if you like, I know there's a liker out there. There's at least like the lone liker. Uh, thank you so much. I, I really do appreciate that. It's so kind. Even when you don't, that's okay. I, 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 it makes me feel like I earned it the one, for every one I get. Um, I, I appreciate cool comments. Um, just even just shooting the shit, saying what's up, talking that good shit. It means a lot. I, I love that so much. And, um, yeah, hopefully I see you soon for some more good news. I love you. Bye-bye. Mwah.